Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ephesians in chapter 4. That is if you're not already there. We'll be, begin our reading today with verse 4. As we've prefaced in the past, verse 4 begins with good reasons for there to be oneness in the body of Christ. There's one body and one spirit, even as you're calling one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's above all and through all and in you all. And in reference to verse 6, I remind you, all the verses, who he's writing to. He's writing to the Ephesian church. So he's writing to each individual member in that body of Christ at Ephesus. And as this is God's word preserved for all ages, it is to his church, his body of Christ at Melbourne. Yes, amen. And wherever else his body may be, in Inverness, in Plant City, in Arcadia, you see. We have looked at the thought of one God and one Father of all who is above all and through all. Today, in you all, keep in mind again the context and who is being written to, spoken to. Yes. God dwells in every believer by his spirit. But as you can see, it's, he, 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 in a real special way, he's in his church, his body of Christ. Turn with me to the book of Romans. The book of Romans in chapter 8. And of course, I have to begin with verse 1 here. There is therefore now no condemnation. To whom? To them which are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Plant that up in the recesses of your memory. In Christ Jesus, because we're going to come back to that. And what's it mean to be in Christ Jesus? Where is he? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. 
who walk after the Spirit. Not after the flesh, but walk after the Spirit. <laughs> I got bogged down on that word after. What's the word after me? Well, according to the Webster Dictionary of 1811, which I would say in our day and time the most credible dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, is the 1811 version. Since then, it seems like the English language has really gotten dumbed down and and that may be all ploy of Satan to confuse the Word of God here. But it means behind in place. Well, that just kind of gives us a little bit of understanding. But that's, that's not all of it. It means later in time. Yeah. <laughs> can you can can you apply that to walking after the spirit? Well, how about an imitation of? How many of you knew after met in, 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 in imitation of? It means according to, as to value. Where's your value? What do you count dear? You walk according to the flesh? Or do you walk according to the Spirit? It means according to, in re, with regards to direction and influence. <laughs> we're, to, we're to walk according to the Spirit in regards to our direction and influence. Of what, in other words, the Spirit of God is to be influencing us in, in our walk. Yes. We're not to be influenced by the flesh and walking according to the influence of the flesh, but we're to be walking according to the influence of the Holy Spirit. Of God, in imitation of. Yes, in a sense, behind the Spirit. I guess the best way we can describe that behind is like a, a, a little boy or girl following behind dad or mom and and they're watching where dad and mom step and they try to step exactly where dad and mom step. <laughs> Those that are in Christ, he said, do not walk according to the flesh, but they walk according to the Spirit. Okay, now let's go on. Verse 8. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. There's nothing about the flesh, the natural man, 
that is pleasing to God. But we are not in the flesh. That is those in verse 1. Those that are in Christ Jesus and they manifest that they're in Christ Jesus because they walk according to the Spirit. In regards to, to, to direction and influence, in regards to value, they value in the things of the Spirit of God. In regards to imitating If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Ha! So the Spirit of God dwells in me. I'm in Christ. The Spirit of God is in me, right? Is that all that can be said that's in me? Now, if any man have not the Spirit of God, Christ, he is not... What did that say? Are you paying attention to the words? The Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ. And where did they say, where did he say the Spirit was? In you. <laughs> it's the Spirit of Christ. In you. Well, doesn't that make Christ in you? You see, I'm in Christ, and he's in me. Isn't that what our text said? In you all? Turn with me to the book of John. Chapter 14. And look at verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. It's the Spirit. Mm -hmm. The Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while and, and yet a little while and the world seeth me no more but ye see me because I live ye shall live also and that day so ye know at, at that day ye shall know that I am in my father and ye in me, and I in you. And there are many, a many believer who claim that, and they'll look to that verse in claiming. Which, in a sense, is true to those who are not in the Lord's church. But these words were spoken to his church. They were spoken to the 11 apostles. Judas gone already. They were words spoken. He said, I'll be in you. Church. So in John chapter 15, still speaking to his church, and there again, many a believer, and I heard some preachers and pastors preach it as to, or oh, in a sense, it is so about all that he's speaking concerning, he's speaking to his church. He said in verse 4, Abide 
in me. That word abide means to remain in. Do, do not depart from. <laughs> abide in. Abide in me, and I in you. So, church, abide in me, and I in you. Who's the church? <laughs> Many different members, but individual members. The church can only abide in Christ and he in the church as each individual member is abiding in him and he in them. And as one member departs and another member departs and another member departs and another member departs, what happens? Pretty soon the church is not abiding in Christ and Christ is not abiding in the church any longer. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. <laughs> In other words, they stop being fruit bearing. Well, just let that sink into your memory for a minute. Sink into your mind. Sink into your heart for a minute. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. And Christ said, I'm the vine. No more can you, church, bring forth fruit except you abide in me. I'll just say this, and there's a lot of churches that cease to bring forth fruit. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Remind you, He's a word spoken to his church. Mm -hmm. Turn with me now to the book of Colossians. Remember, this is in your law. The phrase that we're looking at in, from Ephesians 4, 6 is in your law. One God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Yeah, Colossians chapter 1. Verse 27. Let's read verse 26 with it. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Listen, that, it, that verse is important. That last phrase is important to understanding the mystery. But now is made manifest to his saints. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That mystery is the same mystery as in Ephesians chapter 3. It is concerning the church. It has been hid. It was hid from all generations until Christ came and established his church and, 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 the, and the word went into all the world, to Jew and to Gentile, Jew and Gentile in the same body, bringing glory to God. 
And that is the mystery spoken of. The mystery <laughs> that, that is, but now they manifest to his saints. Listen, they're saints. They've had the gospel. There was Old Testament saints. They had the gospel, but they did not have church truth. It was a mystery to them. And never did God, in the Old Testament, were Jew and Gentile, Jew and Gentile. They did not work alongside of each other in the work of the Lord. But now in his church, <laughs> doesn't matter what color your skin, it doesn't matter the nationality, we work together as the body of Christ Amen. in the work of the Lord. And he said, He's in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is our hope of glory. Whether Jew or Gentile, whether black or white, and so on and so forth. Now, considering the fact that He is in you all. Church. He is desirous of a closer intimacy. He's not satisfied where Grace Baptist Church is. Are you? You ought not to be. I ought not to be. He, he's desirous of an even closer relationship. A closer walk with him in intimacy. Turn with me to the book of James. The book of James in chapter 4. Draw nigh to verse 8. Draw nigh to God. Draw near to God. The, the, the construction of that verb draw is of such that, that, that it has no regard to past, present, or future. So, as we think about that, it doesn't matter that we're, we're near to him yesteryear. It doesn't matter that we're near to him with regards to the present. It doesn't matter that you hope to be in the future. It's without regard to past, present, or future. And, and it also is denoting a, an imperative. How many of you know what an imperative is? It's a command. Draw near. And, and the construction of the verb draw is the subject, is the doer of the action. We are commanded to draw near. We are the doer. We are to draw near. As, as a child of God and a member of the Grace Baptist Church, Melbourne, Florida, we are commanded to draw near to God. Did you draw as close to God in 2019 as you could have? Be careful. <laughs> yeah. Have you done this word perfectly yet? Have I done it perfectly yet? Has my heart always been perfect towards God in 2019? Oh, 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 oh. Before you answer that, 
What about your relationship with your fellow man? Do you know that if your relationship with your fellow man's not always been what it should be? That your relationship with God wasn't what it should be. Because God commanded that we honor Him with all our soul, heart, and mind. Commanded that we love our neighbor as ourselves. Amen. And there's not a one here that's done that. So, we got a lot of room for improvement, don't we? Oh, well, we're getting bogged down here. Let's go on. And he, God, God now becomes the subject, will draw near to you. And that again is without regard to past, present, or future. He's always willing at any time to draw near to you. But only as you draw near to him. Amen. Now, okay. More sentence structure. How do we do that? Well, let's continue, keep reading. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Cleanse your hands. What, what is symbolic of the hands? <coughs> Doing. The hands through Scripture are symbolic of doing. And with might. Cleanse your hands. Well, how do I cleanse what I'm doing? We're commanded to cleanse, cleanse our hands. In an effort to draw near to God, we must cleanse our hands. Well, how do I cleanse my hands? Well, let's keep reading. And purify your hearts. <laughs> Make your hearts pure. Make your hearts clean. <laughs> you see? We cleanse our thoughts, our words, and our doings by purifying the heart. How do we purify the heart? Well, it goes back to this morning, doesn't it? The Word of God. Psalms 119, 9, 10, and 11. The Word of God. The water of the Word. And by, by the way we, we cleanse ourselves, the way we purify it. Read it. We'll get to it eventually sometime. We're willing of, uh, uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 5. But he's, he's cleansing his body, his, his blood. And how is he doing that? With the water of the word. Amen. So how do we purify our hearts? With the washing of the water of the Word of God. We purify our hearts. Thus we get clean hands. And in doing so, then we draw near to God. And He'll draw near to us. Isn't that blessing? Isn't that sweet? I love that. <laughs> Who said the Bible didn't teach re human responsibility? <laughs> We're responsible. Yes. But God gets all the credit yes. for our doing. Right? Yes. Amen. God gets all the credit. Yes. Listen, you say, wow, that's an impossible task. 
that's a defeatist attitude. Remember what he said? First John. Come on, first John four. And verse four. The first three verses told us, believe not every spirit, try the spirits, see whether they be of God or not. Because there are some evil spirits in the world. Verse 4, he says, Ye are of God, little children. I have overcome them. Have overcome what? The evil spirits. Those that, those that confess not that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the anointed of God. We've overcome them. Well, how have we overcome them? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Listen, who's in us? We're in Christ, and Christ is in us. And how is Christ in us? By his Spirit. Yes. Amen. And that which is in us is greater yeah. than that which is in the world. So I can purify my heart and cleanse my hands and draw near to God. Amen. Oh, aren't you glad he's in you? Aren't you glad you're in him? You see? He's in his children. He, yes. But Ephesians 4 was written to his local assemblies. He's in his churches. His New Testament Baptist churches. And how do we know they are New Testament Baptist churches? Because not every church that calls itself Baptist is Baptist. How do we know that? Because they manifest themselves by keeping his teachings. Back to <laughs> Matthew 28, in verse 20. Teaching them to observe is a responsibility. It's part of the commission of, that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to his church. He said, hey, hey, after, we, after we preach the gospel, they're saved, and then they're baptized, then our responsibility is to continue in teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lo, I am with you always. Listen, how do we recognize that a church is a New Testament Baptist church, is a church of the Lord Jesus Christ? We recognize them by their teachings, by their doings. Listen, and boy, that brings up a big subject because Brother Hilly and I got a, got a, a, a great, well, it's not a hobby horse, it's a pet peeve right now because, you know, Preachers that want to have come preach, I have them fill out questionnaire, and they 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 filling out pretty much the right answers, but the answers they give don't line up with some of their practices and what they're doing. Can I have them preach? Can I have them stand in this pulpit? Not in all good conscience, I can't. Hey, I'm set here as the under shepherd, as the pastor of this church to guard it, yes. to protect it, to watch over it, to teach and to instruct you. So that when the Lord's done with me, and, and it comes time to get another man in, you don't get just any fly-by-night out there. There are men that will tell you the right answers, but their practice is all wrong. you got to look at the whole picture, brethren, when you're calling a man. Yes, amen. That's how we know. 
That's how they were manifested in the book of Acts, wasn't it? Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. And it didn't matter that they had a, a growth explosion in the second chapter. Isn't that what we would call it today, a growth explosion? Verse 41 of chapter 2. Well, I'm in the book of John. Let me get to, let me get to Acts. It would help if I was in Acts. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. My goodness! Boy, we would be in an instant building program, wouldn't we not? While well, we'd get rid of this parking lot out here, we'd find some place that had plenty of room to, to park them all, wouldn't we? But what would we do in the meanwhile? Well, we'd have them hang, hanging out the windows and in the back and out here in the lawn and out here in the front. We'd have PA speakers set up out there and be preaching and teaching the world gone. And then the city would hit us with noise complaint. That, that's true. They, they would. Now, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They continued steadfastly. What's that word? Steadfastly. They continued steadfastly. What's that mean? To continue steadfastly. They adhered to. How? how what's it mean to adhere to? Stick to. You can't get it apart. Submit it together. Amen. Brother Mike likes gorilla tape. Why? Because the gorilla tape on that duck that he cut off the, the other day after being on there 14 years, he still he said it still had some adhesive to it, some stick to it. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're to do. Amen. To what? To the Lord's teachings. Amen. That's how we're known by the world. To be the Lord's. That's how someone looking for the Lord's church distinguishes whether it's the Lord's church or not. Amen. By the things they're teaching. He's in his churches. They're his. And it is only them it is only them that are his as distinguished by their teachings and their practice to have authority. To have authority to exist. They're the only ones that have authority to evangelize. They're the only ones that have authority to baptize. They're the only ones that have authority to teach the things of God and to bring forth other churches. They are. This church, as it is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the pillar and ground of the truth. Amen. Turn with me to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, chapter 3. In verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. <laughs> I don't have time to go into all this. But I'll just tell you this, context, context, context again. Mm -hmm. He's telling Timothy about how, how to behave in the house of God. Every member
pastors, deacons, every member. You want to know how to behave in the house of God? You go back and you start with verse 1. And go down through the third chapter. And don't just say, well, that's applying to the pastor. That's applying to the deacon. No, that's applying to every church member. He said, that thou mayest know how to behave thyself. In the house of God. Which is the church of the living God. The pillar and ground of the truth. <coughs> Again. How do we recognize the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? By their teachings and by their practice. Are you holy, set apart, mm -hmm. under God? It's serious business. If your name is on the membership of this role, you're a member of the body of Christ. And I, and you, ought to not only be verifying that by teaching. But we ought to be ver verifying it by our actions. Yes. By our doings. One God and Father of all. Who is above all. Through all. And in you. You. Did you notice that word? You? Another word. Notice the words. In you. In who? Who is he writing to? He's writing to the Ephesian assembly. He's writing to members of the Ephesian assembly. Members of the Lord's body. In you all. Grace Baptist Church. In you all. Not just in me. In you all, we're the body of Christ. Members, individual, yes. But God has set us here as it has pleased him for the working of the body, which, as we continue on, is the edifying the body of Christ in, to unity till he come. Shall we stand? <clears throat>